I'm going to talk about oil and money. I hope that isn't too jarring in the atmosphere here, which is so much more relaxed and so much more pleasant than oil and money. Uh, before I do that, I'd just like to say a word about uh, the New Economics Foundation, which is uh, the uh, organization with which I have been involved for at least 20 years now uh, as a trustee and as a former chairman and now as emeritus trustee. Um, the New Economics Foundation arose out of something called the Other Economic Summit, which used to meet, and still does occasionally, I think, uh, next to the G7 or G10, uh, the uh, idea being that the other economic summit would represent the rest of the world, whereas the G7 represented the rich world. Sorry, is that not still? Uh, and from that, the group of people who initiated that uh, function they uh, took advantage of the publicity around the G7 and became quite well known uh, as a group known as TOES. Uh, and TOES gave rise to the New Economics Foundation, which from the start focused on the GDP, alternative measures of wealth, and pointing out uh, to people how completely misguided the GDP is as a guide to economic welfare, uh, as uh, Helen and others have mentioned. Uh, and now we have been focusing for the last 20 years on developing these alternatives and in particular on well-being and when we produced the Happy Planet Index and put it on the, uh, on the internet, we had over a million downloads in the first two or three months that it was up there. And you can still download not only the Happy Planet Index but numerous other publications that we have produced. We have a staff of around 50 researchers in London and uh, at any one time, we're doing at least 100 different projects, uh, all related to what we call the Great Transition. And the Great Transition is the overall theme that we are tackling uh, to try to decide what kind of economic system could replace the present unsustainable one, and how, do we get, how are we going to get there? Because those are two separate and very difficult questions. And I have wanted to focus today on the two overriding issues, which are oil and money, because they actually control not only the world economy, but also all of you, all of us here today. None of us would be in this room today if it wasn't for oil and money. We know that uh, oil, to start with the oil situation, uh, the oil price was confidently predicted by The Economist, which I'm afraid to say I used to work for, uh, many uh, back in 2000, uh, they said that where the world is awash with oil, price of oil was $10 a barrel, and they predicted that it would go on costing $10 a barrel up until at least 2030. Well, we all know that wasn't a very clever prediction. And now we are facing a permanent uh, oil price at the, uh, at the moment of 100 and around $110, $120 a barrel. And we've been working on this in the New Economics Foundation to look at the effects of the end of cheap oil, because that is what has happened. We have used up all of the cheap, easy oil, and we are now in a situation where it is becoming increasingly risky and increasingly expensive to get more oil out of the earth. And the reason, apart from climate change, one of the main reasons for trying to get away from our dependence, our total addiction to oil, is that we need to, uh, we need to, uh, to get uh, not only clear of the climate change, but also um, the total dependence of the economy on transport in particular. And transport, as you know, permeates right through the economy so that as the price of oil goes up, price of transport goes up, everything grows up. And we have just produced uh, at the New Economics Foundation uh, I th a publication which I think deserves a great deal of attention. Unfortunately, I've only got one or two with me, but I'm gonna put it out. It's easily downloaded from the, uh, from the uh, website. And it's called The Economics of Oil Dependence, uh, a glass ceiling to recovery. And the glass ceiling relates to the fact that 
there is now a very clear link between recession and the oil price. And it's quite becoming increasingly clear that when the oil price reaches a certain level, the world economy begins to go into recession. As it goes into recession, so economic activity slows down, the price falls, and there is a beginning of a recovery. But as it recovers, more demand for oil, the oil price goes up, and you hit your head again against this glass ceiling, and it goes down again. It brings about recession, and it starts going down again. And you may have noticed that we've been talking increasingly in the last uh, year, two or three years, about double dip recessions, and now we're talking about triple dip recessions, and I would not be surprised to expect that we will have quadruple, quintuple dip recessions because of this glass ceiling. So if that is going to put a lid on recovery, a, a glass ceiling to recovery, it means that we have effectively reached the end of growth. It's not a question of our deciding whether it's the end of growth. The end of growth is forced upon us. We have no alternative because we are so dependent on our. So in that situation, let's turn to money and see what is the effect on the monetary situation. How much is that? Six. Uh -huh. Halfway. <laughs> um, so the, the, monet the monetary situation is, of course, profoundly affected by all this. But the, the, the money, the real problem about money is very few people seem to understand actually how money works. And I'm not saying that in a sort of patronizing way, because when you carry out polls, as have been done in Europe, and ask people where they think money comes from, almost everybody believes that it comes from the government or from the central bank or from a combination of the two. And if you say to people, do you think it would be a good idea if we had a system of money whereby it's created by private bankers for their profit and put into the economy in the form of loans on which they charge interest, fees, or, uh, commissions, etc., and which they destroy when they get paid back. So they float the money in the air, out of thin air, get paid fees, commissions, interest on it, and then when it's paid back, finish, it's gone. Is that really, would, would you think that was a good idea? And universally, everybody says, you must be crazy. I don't, I, don't be, I don't believe that this is the way that with money is created. And we have difficulty in persuading people that this is actual fact. And even people, Paul Krugman, the other day in an argument with Steve Keen, he denied that uh, banking had anything to do with the creation of money, which is just incomprehensible. <laughs> so, um, so we decided in the, in the New Economics Foundation that what is really needed is education because people need to understand how money works. It's not actually anything like as complex and difficult as people imagine. And once you understand it, you cannot believe that it's actually true because it is so mad and it is so ridiculous that bankers should be allowed to have this incredible privilege and to literally coin money. And 97% of the money that is now in circulation is created in this way, and we're all paying a tax on it, to, to, the, to the bankers, to the private sector bankers. And then we wonder, how do we stop them giving each other such enormous sums of money? The obvious way to do it is to change the system. You don't, there's no point in capping it. You don't have to change the system. So, so, so there, are, there are two principal products of this system of money. The first is the uh, inequality that it creates, because you're seeing now a continuous process, accelerating process, of polarization of wealth. The 1% elite who is becoming owners of more and more wealth. I think, I can never remember the, the actual figures, but the last one I saw, I think, is that the, the top 1% uh, own 40% of the world's wealth and have 18% of the income. And the bottom 80% have, I think it's uh, something under 10, under 10%. Uh, anyway, it's in those proportions. And 
th that is a direct result of this money creation system. The other really pernicious uh, result of the system is that because the money is created in the form of lending, the banks create the money in the form of loans, as I was saying, and this means that whatever money goes into the economy, we have to pay interest on it, and therefore there is a continuous growth. And that is why we are forced into a situation where every government has to grow in order to meet the debt that is piling up. And you get a situation now in Greece where people are starving because they are in debt and their austerity program is designed to pay back debt, but also, to, most importantly, as Mark mentioned yesterday, to, uh, to pay the interest on it. And this interest is completely a, a, a figment of the imagination, in fact, and is a product of a banking system which is rotten. So those, those two results of the financial system and monetary system mean that we have to have a, a complete reformation of that. But that is going to be extremely difficult to do because there are obviously huge vested interests, very, very powerful interests. Uh, the, all of the people who control the monetary system and who control the big corporations are all absolutely united against it. So the only hope is that the slow motion collapse that is taking place now because of the oil system, uh, the, the, our dependence on oil and its increase in price and because of the monetary system, that is a built-in formula for collapse. There is no way that that can go on. It is bound to collapse. It is in the process of collapse at this moment. And it's going to accelerate. Sometimes it'll go faster, sometimes it goes slower. But ultimately, that collapse is going to happen. And that it's, go it's not our choice. It's going to be forced upon the people who at the moment are resisting it. Now that brings me to the final point, which is localization. Because the only answer to this, and it is a very good answer, is localization. We, can, we may not be able to persuade the bankers to give up their privileges. We may not be able to persuade multinational corporations to stop uh, the, the damage that they do to the earth immediately. We can work on it, but it's going to take some time. But that will be fixed to a large extent by the collapse. What we can do is we can start a million, a myriad of experiments at, this, at the local level. We can experiment with all sorts of different methods of currencies, of distributed energy production, anaerobic digestion, windmills, uh, water, uh, hydro uh, schemes, all of the distributed energy, small scale uh, projects that are possible to do. We can also can, uh, experiment with monetary systems and if you look on YouTube, you'll see some fascinating um, films coming out from, I saw one particular Volos in Greece, about how they have invented their own uh, system of monetary, uh, money system for their own uh, community, and it's having a huge effect. Uh, oh, well, I think I've timed that quite well. Is that <laughs> so what I'm saying is that now is the time for experimentation of every conceivable kind at the local level. And this is why I think Helen has got it absolutely spot on right, that this is where the emphasis has to be. And everybody can play a part in doing something on that. Thank you very much.